Um, I was thinking of starting with this question uh, that Brynhildur mentioned in her talk, uh, namely, uh, why is it that uh, why is it that we have to share our thoughts about artworks? I, I thought that was a good point you made. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, if you would like to elaborate on that or? Well, uh, I don't know if I have much to add to what uh, uh, the thoughts that I presented earlier uh, that came from the group that I was working with uh, earlier this month, but uh, I, I just think it has something to do with us being social beings, that uh, my, my thoughts, my language, my being uh, becomes what it is through interacting <coughs> with other people, whether it's about art or other uh, areas in culture or in the being. Um, Yes, I think that's what it's about. Um, Haraldur, you can you can yeah, go. Yeah. You can also talk yeah, out of the yeah, box. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I had formed an answer actually, <laughs> or, uh, quoting something you talked about uh, from yesterday. I, uh, you know, first thought that came to mind is that we share thoughts on art to challenge the laziness and nostalgia that is established in our school system. And yeah, that's it. You can stop now. <laughs> there's, there's one thing that uh, I've actually thought of mentioning, so I, earlier I may as well mention it now, which I think is, is, is uh, one thing that's in common really in some sense with all the essays in the book that's to say with uh, uh, the way we, the seven authors and curators, seem to think about, about, uh, about things, uh, is that uh, we really don't think art is problematic as such. Uh, the problems we have in talking about art and uh, defining art or, uh, or, uh, or uh, um, let's say making sense of art are our problems, not the artworks. <laughs> the the uh, the painting or artwork, whatever it is, is not in itself problematic. It's it's just there. It has lots to say. <coughs> some artworks have lots to say. Some don't. Uh, but uh, so perhaps we we talk about art in order to clarify our own thinking rather than in order to, we don't necessarily talk about art in order to uh, explain or understand the art. We talk about art in order to, uh, to explain and understand how we ourselves think. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is, may sound like sophistry, but it is, I think, a, a very important uh, distinction. And that also, uh, I think, uh, uh, goes a long way to explaining why we uh, feel that art is important. Because it can provoke in us this kind of uh, thinking, this kind of uh, a new understanding, really, of who we are and how we think about things. May I, may I yes. immediately, because I really love, love this point, that, and I want to add to it that my experience so often through, through art in, in, in any, even in any form and creative experience, storytelling especially also, um, is that it somehow has helped me to establish the awareness that I have my own thinking really, that there is something that I experience really on that, as, that is my own. So, as, the, as an opposite of the love of facts that we are brought up to, to believe in, and so how, in a way, 
contradicting this constant uh, remind, uh, reminders since from, from when we are probably five or six years old or even earlier to, to this day in everyone's life here that, that we are kind of, um, we can be categorized based on how much we know and remember of some given facts that have probably, most of them, nothing to do with our lives. Uh, at the same time, be somehow being uh, disencouraged to, to experience our own inner world. And uh, this world I described with you here in the, in the, at the end of my talk about the prince and etc. These our, my, our own thoughts. So I think that is part of the discussion need that we, we find there a venue without right and wrong good and bad somehow we, we are it's a, it's a venue that is so close to our inner life that, that we enjoy it and we seek it we, we enjoy more the discussion of this kind than, than reminders of facts and this competition of cleverness to some degree we all share this subconscious there is a there is a kind of common common uh, common common uh, yeah subconscious in which we take part um, now how we how we how we then manage to communicate or, or create something or think something new or make something new is uh, is the the other question really and uh, I think uh, in that sense philosophy and art are different strategies that's a good term to use uh, perhaps different strategies for towards the same end for achieving similar goals. Uh, but but uh, but certainly different, and that's one of the things. Now getting back to the kind of choosing <laughs> artworks for the exhibition, uh, one of the things we talked a lot about uh, in the uh, when we were discussing preparing for this exhibition and the whole project more than a year ago, we we, we started uh, was. Uh, about the thought in art uh, and for a while the exhibition was supposed to be called Thinking Art uh, I just say uh, with a kind of double meaning thinking about art or art that can think and then I noticed when these on the sheet of paper you were showing us earlier that you didn't project on the screen uh, that uh, one of the questions that had come up in your discussion with children or teenagers was, can art think? Uh, and, uh, and yes, I think art can think in some, some important sense. It can, it can generate interpretations, getting back to what Hafthor was talking about, uh, and it can generate different messages, different meanings for different people or same people at, at different times. Um, uh, I suppose philosophy can be a bit like that. We can come back to, say, Hegel or, or rediscover Kierkegaard or something, but, uh, um, but essentially we would like philosophy to be a little more straightforward than that, generally. Um, it shouldn't really be possible to interpret a uh, philosophical text in wildly different ways. Whereas with artworks, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, the more possible interpretations we can find for an artwork, uh, the better it probably is. I mean, it, the more it has to give us. So what philosophers can do then, uh, 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 with regard to art, uh, is perhaps not so much to, to provide interpretations. Uh, that's something that we do as viewers all the time, and, and uh, each viewer has to, to, to figure that out for himself in a way. But we can, uh, we can try to uh, talk about the artwork and analyze how it does what it does. Um, so there is, we, can, we can try to look at, really, the strategy behind the artwork, 
or within the artwork really that allows it uh, to be so interesting and to, to, to open up these possibilities for understanding, for creativity uh, on our own part. And uh, how, how is this done? And in some cases, it's, it's, uh, in some cases, it's probably really simple. An example that I take in my text myself is the artwork up here by Sigurd uh, uh On the floor, there's a, a loaf of bread, uh, a ring of keys, a tin of pipe tobacco, a vacuum cleaner, a little tricycle, uh, eight objects in all. And the, the work is called, or the exhibition, this was originally an exhibition in Amsterdam, it was called Eight Poems. Whoa, wait a minute. I thought this was, uh, I thought this was a, a loaf of bread and a vacuum cleaner. Now, it's, now, it's, now they're poems. And why eight? What does that have to do with it? So there's a very simple strategy for, for turning uh, commonplace objects into something else. You just tell people, Ah, no, these are not commonplace objects, they're poems. Deal with it. And, and that, of course, can really set the creative juices flowing on the part of, of the viewer. It, it really it gives you kind of a different way of thinking about the world. Can I go around the world uh, looking at commonplace objects and thinking of them as poems? How exciting. You know, it's a wonderful world. So uh, this, is, this is the kind of thing that, that I think philosophy can certainly bring to uh, our understanding of art. Uh, not so much providing explanations, uh, but elucidating the process really, uh, perhaps to make it more effective or to make us more open to it. Because the most dangerous thing uh, when it comes to uh, audiences and art uh, is that audiences decide very quickly on what it means or whether it's interesting um, or they decide that they like like you were saying with the, with the children and teenagers that uh, uh, it can sometimes be very difficult to get beyond I like or I don't like uh, and to start really thinking about things um, so in, in some sense, I think that is kind of the, the connection we can make at any rate. I would like to turn the attention to the critique of postmodernism that Ayit mentioned in his speech, in his talk. Uh, postmodernism used to be criticized for being a kind of relativism, uh, making everything equal and uh, now it is criticized for being essentialist. Um, could you explain this for us, or at least elucidate it? I think everybody hates postmodernism nowadays. There's, uh, there's somehow the scapegoat. <laughs> um, so now have turned against postmodernism. Uh, uh, the so-called multiculturalism has become essentialist and uh, Bourdieu the distinguishes multiculturalism from cultural pluralism and the distinction isn't quite clear. Um, uh, my feeling for Bourdieu from my sort of sporadic readings and the lecture especially yesterday um, uh, and, and, and the, the or maybe it's my wishful thinking, because if, if, this is, if I'm right, then I agree with him, <laughs> that uh, uh, postmodernism really didn't live up to the promise. You see. And it's a bit like, like Thorvald and the Box. Uh, <clears throat> uh, postmodernists ended up uh, really, uh, or postmodernism ended up really being too tight to the origins that it tried to deny. If, uh, if you spend all your time criticizing teleology, um, isn't that a kind of tele teleology? Uh, I mean, you have, you have this one goal in mind, uh, the myth of, of some kind of unified origin. Um, and if you cannot get away from it, if, you, if you're stuck in the criticism of that origin, then you're really still in the box. Um, so, uh, 
that is one. Yeah, yeah I think so. I mean, yeah. uh, this is something Burio, I think, mentions that, that postmodernism happens always to be post and to not alter. That, mm -hmm. that is the, the <laughs> big difference with its uh, but, uh, solution. But uh, so, so, and it, then it always refers to some, well, uh, golden age that has disappeared and. and uh, but I think one shouldn't forget that postmodernism was already criticized in the 80s and, and 90s, um, not only for, for being uh, relativistic, but, uh, but maybe exactly and in, in, in being a useless. Um, unproductive. Yeah, unproductive uh, ism. And, uh, but then uh, no, we would. We, uh, and then, then there were so many, do you remember the, the, the debates that, that nobody uh, was able to, to define it anyway, so, so uh, I don't know, it's, uh, there was ne maybe never any hold on it either. Um, yeah? Artist, as I am, I think I'm a typical artist, in, even in the English term that I learned many years ago, stupid as a painter, <laughs> meaning that the bliss of ignorance can be a very important, you know, light shed, shed into the philosophical and, and, and uh, uh, academic discussion and f categorization and things like that. When we, as, as an artist, I have really, really enjoyed having the privilege, you know, not to understand or take part in the hardcore discussion or debate, not meaning that I am totally ignorant, but yet free to, you know, to take, to pick up what I understand at that moment, uh, that day, in that term, and use it as a tool, even calling myself something just for three days, when it, it's, it's practicality that we are we also, we, we have the advantage of, uh, when the academics, like, like sitting next to me, they cannot not allow themselves to be totally practical, <laughs> in meaning that, you know, it, it, there has to be continuity. And, and as I understand postmodernism, you must not think that I am, um, and now I'm controlling your thinking, of course, trying <laughs> once more, uh, uh, that I am, that I, I wake up every day thinking how, how great it is to be a postmodernist. <laughs> it's exactly the opposite. I, 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 uh, what I understand, have understood or picked up uh, from the discussion or, and, and, uh, explanation of, of this uh, period of time or, or framework of thinking has been a useful tool for me, to, or tools, once in a while. In, or, but at the, on the, at the end of the day, as in the beginning, I, I think I share with many artists and philosophers this beautiful experience of that despite my, my uh, education or attempts to be educated, I can, I can really f wake up after all these years trying to be something as not, no nothing, meaning no one thing. And, and in a way, I, I, I think this, my, my ideas of postmodernism as I was in school, the school uh, here, academy here and, and abroad at that time when it was flourishing, helped me a great deal to, to, f to feel free to 
not only use whatever was useful at that moment, but to, to acknowledge how totally irrelevant my thoughts now were to my thoughts just five minutes ago. You know. <laughs> Enjoying and experiencing one more day, one more moment of total contradiction. <laughs> you know. And that has created somehow kind of a strange hole. <laughs> you know. I got out of the hole and into the hole somehow, like that. I think you make the best of most optimism. <laughs> <laughs> but there is maybe an ambiguity here that, uh, I mean, even the fiercest critics of postmodernism uh, have uh, admitted that we live in postmodern times, that, that postmodernism in some sense uh, prevails and, and rules our lives, but then that uh, what should be done in such a moment is exactly not to be a postmodernist. Um, but to fight back, uh, fight this, this postmodern uh, situation. So uh, it needs a lot of, of clarification, of course, but, but uh, I think that this is just an example of how, how difficult the, the concept is. And maybe you never really know what it is that is termed as or labeled as postmodern. Um, I want to just, I just remember, remember now a strange thing uh, because of this short this discussion. Yesterday evening, there was a party, uh, me and my wife, uh, that came my wife on Friday evening. Hello, my husband. We made <laughs> yesterday evening a party for friends, a lot of friends and, uh, and acquaintances. And, and because we are moving abroad, uh, we decided to, to give them gifts uh, in the party. So there was a whole room f with books and uh, dresses and things, and things from our homes that we didn't want to keep any more, so we wanted someone else to use it, and mostly it was books from my collection. And one of the books I gave away there, <laughs> I've, been, I've been having for many, many years, and attempted to read it again and again, and I was quite relieved when I gave it, I put it in the shelf yesterday, and someone took it really, it's called What is Postmodernism? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I wanted to make a joke about what is the future, but uh, <laughs> the future will be a joke, uh, <laughs> own perhaps. And the future, the future, and and here I would like you to think of Olaver in Austria. The future <laughs> is one where where artists can use philosophers as, uh, as they like, uh, and and I think it'll be a very exciting collaboration. I'm looking forward to. When, uh, when I myself will be featured in an exhibition somewhere, uh, hopefully not too long from now. <laughs> okay, well, let's finish with philosophers becoming artworks. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you.